Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to America's Heroes Group. I'm Stephanie Collada. I'm the AHT correspondent, and I am a retired Army Reserve veteran. I'm here to talk about what's next. So we already had um, our Democratic National Convention. If you haven't noticed, it was like a rock show. So if you haven't gone back to see it, I highly recommend to go do that or at least listen to some of the speeches. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that you may have learned or may learn and find out about um, all the people that are running for um, office, not just um, Vice President Kamala Harris. You can find out a lot more about other people that are running. They also did a great segment of where the veterans came in that are running for office uh, as a Democrat, and they came in, they got a little bit of a wonderful spotlight. So um, if you can, look that up. You can also go in and listen to podcasts. There's a lot of different podcasts that have um, all of those speeches recorded, so you can get some really good information. Now, what's next? My favorite quote from West Wing, my favorite show, I tend to talk about that or reference that a lot. And um, if you didn't know, that's what President Bartlett says when he's done with whatever they're talking about and he wants to move on. So after a lot of politics and conventions and things, let's move on and find out what's what else is going to be happening. So after both um, primary party conventions, what is normally next for American politics in the election year? Obviously the general election. But after that, or other than that, exactly, <laughs> at least, um, other than that, you would actually, um, we were, were waiting for many different things. So um, Vice President Kamala Harris is running for uh, president, obviously, and she will be doing a lot of rallies with her now vice president uh, candidate, um, Tim Walls. And so Right now, they are scheduled this week for going to Georgia, Savannah, Georgia, especially. And then they're going to be doing a bus tour through the south part and rural areas of South Georgia, which I think is very interesting because um, that is normally very red, very Republican um, districts. So they're going down there to try to reach those Democrats or at least anybody that disagrees with the uh, Republican candidate excuse me, former President uh, Donald Trump. So they're going into those areas to hopefully get a little bit more votes and maybe squeeze a little bit more of a lead um, in Georgia. Now, why Georgia? Um, well, let me just first go to um, former President Trump and um, his candidate for Vice President, J.D. Vance. They're also going to uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and also Pennsylvania those rallies will be happening. And those states are usually the top of the list because they are on the list for um, battleground states. Uh, so when we do that, when we're looking at these states, they are battleground states and they are battleground states because they are within a very slim margin of the president of winning by the points. Um, in 2020, they were uh, one within, I think, a three-point three point margin. And so those type of things can be right there on the line of the mar margin of error. If you, anyone knows about polling and statistics. So it's really difficult to try to gauge on where the state will swing because they also call them swing states on where, which um, color that they may swing red or blue. Last uh, presidential election, all of the swing states went for president Biden, except for North Carolina. North Carolina is still put there for a um, for as a battleground state because right now it was within the margin of error, but some polls says it's for um, Vice President Kamala Harris and some says it's Trump. So we'll see how that one goes. Um, and then when we're going through and looking at those states, there's a lot of things that could be fought out in the polls. Um, there hasn't been very many polls that came out since the uh, Democratic National Convention. So we're still waiting to see what those numbers are going to look like to see how the convention affected the battleground states. We'll see. Um, often the uh, conventions do happen in a battleground state, for, but for this um, for this time, they actually did not do that. They did it in Illinois, which is typically very blue and very democratic. So we'll see if that had anything to affect by it 
as well, but the Democratic National Convention had a huge amount of viewership and ratings, um, which we know that former President Trump was irate about, and he did not like that uh, he didn't have the attention. So we'll see how things go on how that really affected the polls. Um, there's other states like my state of Florida that may become a sleeper uh, swing state because it's it has been leaning more and having more Republicans registration uh, since the 2020 election, especially since um, former President Donald Trump moved to Florida. So we'll still still seeing how that one would go out. Um, and one of the reasons why it might be a sleeper state is because it and other states that aren't battleground states that may become a swing state, but at least, or at least get very close to the margin of error for the polls is because they actually have ballot measures at the general election that tend to swing towards more of policies within the Democratic Party. And those I mean for reproductive health protections, um, recreational marijuana is also on the ballot for Florida, and I believe it should be popping up for other states as well. Uh, reproductive health protections are going to other states. Um, there's still at least four other states that may get that added, but we're not sure just yet, but there are others that will. And it's a good thing to probably watch because every time that reproductive health uh, protections, i.e. abortion, Every time it was up for the people, it has actually came into in the favor of providing those protections for women. So even though they are very red states, those things also tend to swing towards putting in those protections instead of outlawing abortion. So that is really important to try to watch and see how that would, would go because there's so many up for um, election this time we're not sure how it's going to go. We're going to see a lot more going. So the pool is bigger. The statistics are bigger because we've only had a few states since then have actually had that type of election and that type of procedure. So I think it's probably going to change. I think a few states may swing to, uh, may fail to actually put in those protections, but we'll see how that one will go. Um, it also will depend on how the, um, how everybody else is elected. There's a few other um, incumbents that are facing very difficult elections, like Senator John Tester. He is a Democrat from Montana, and which is a very red state, and he's always struggled um, every time he comes up for election, but it's very frustrating because he does so many for our veterans. He was one of the um, biggest champions for the PACT Act, which we'll be discussing the next time I come on. So. I'm going to slide right past that one. But um, Senator John Tester does um, have a big fight. Um, it's a uh, fight within the margin of error. So he may lose his position, but we'll see. Um, his polls for actually um, against him, basically showing that he was losing when President Biden was still running for presidential candidate. And that's one of the many reasons why he chose not to is because it was actually hurting those um, Democrats that are in very close elections. So since then, there has been an increase in the polls for other Democrats that are running that are in tight elections. Their favorability went up a little bit more, especially with um, with Vice President Kamala Harris taking the top of the ticket. So it may help us out a little bit. Another thing about Florida is that um, incumbent Senator Rick Scott, who is actually a very unpopular character here in the state. Um, he was a very unpopular co governor and I'm still not sure how he got elected in the first place. I apologize. Um, but he has a uh, new person uh, going opponent because our primaries just uh, completed last week. So they so we'll see how that one will go about. And um, he, they're within the margin and errors as well. So there might be more Democratic turnout for the Florida election that can swing the uh, state of Florida very close to the margin error. And it may came, come out to very few um, ballots, few votes uh, to see how that one will turn out. Um, then for uh, the rest of the uh, time until the general election, we actually have 
a presidential uh, debate coming up uh, September 10th. It was very much out uh, in the uncertainty realm because um, after uh, Vice, uh, President Biden had basically stepped off of the ticket and Vice President Kamala Harris stepped onto the top of the ticket, we weren't quite sure of whether President Trump was going to adhere to the agreements that he made with the Biden camp. And often it's pretty difficult because whatever Trump says would be completely different from what his team will actually release to the press. They'll say something, he'll come out and then speak to the press and say something completely different. So there was a lot of uncertainty out there to see how that one would play out and whether he would keep to the same agreements. And then recently he posted on his true social account saying that he will um, abide to the agreements that he made with President Biden, including the um, rule about muting the mics. Now, what is this about muting the mics when, during the debate? So just a little bit of a reminder back in history of the 2020 presidential debate that Trump had with Biden. Uh, there was a lot of interruptions and talking over and a lot of viral moments. And if you um, ever wanted to look back and check that out, uh, it is all over YouTube and you can relive it like the rest of us that probably still remember it in the back of our minds um, because it was very difficult for President Biden to get a word in. And he's not much of a debater because he does have a um, speech impediment like myself, I have a speech impediment and a stutter, but he has a speech impediment and a stutter. And then when that, uh, inter those interruptions happen, you have a lot of trouble trying to get back on track, trying to stick to what you were saying, and also try to keep your speech in a way that everybody will understand and probably not make fun of. So you could probably understand the reason why that uh, when the presidential debate uh, negotiations were happening between President Biden and President Trump, they decided to try to put in the rule about muting the mics. So whenever a speaker is speaking, the other person's mic will be muted. That way they can't talk over each other while they're trying to have their minute or two to have to speak about certain subjects or respond to questions or even respond to the other candidate. Um, so that part uh, was part of the debate that was supposed to be in for the debate that happened with Biden and also the one that's happening on September 10th. So when Vice President Kamala Harris's team took over, they wanted to take the rule out about the muted mics. Why would they want to do this? They want to mute the mic or they want to take out the rule of muting the mics because honestly, they probably want to have President Trump talk more and show himself more and probably show his base behavior when he is not policing himself or trying to keep within the box of the rules that he's supposed to keep within. It's very difficult for somebody to um, show themselves their true colors when they have all of these different rules and all of these leashes and restrictions. And President Trump did very well with himself. I don't even think, because I, I was actually checking to see if he was speaking, even though the mics were muted. I couldn't even tell. Um, also, I was just very, um, I was very reactionary to the way that President Biden had um, seemed during it. So it was very difficult to see, uh, to try to keep attention to President Trump at that moment. But I don't remember him speaking at all, even though the mics were muted. So, or speaking under his breath, because he does tend to do that as well. Um, but didn't see any of that happening. So whether he would actually do that or not, um, for uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, it's possible. Um, if you remember back in the 2016 presidential debate with, um, with Hillary Clinton, he did the same thing. He spoke under his breath. And if you remember, he called um, presidential, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton a nasty woman. And uh, ever since then, there were viral moments about that and memes and uh, very many, uh, very much 
merchandise, many merchandise that came out to that said nasty woman. And many women actually wore those as badges of honor after that. So um, just a little reminder of what happened eight years ago uh, with that one. So I think that the uh, Harris camp was actually hoping to try to get some more uh, viral moments, more ways to try to sneak in there to get more social media um, press because they've been doing pretty well on that. After um, Kamala, Kamala Harris was actually coming in um, as the top of the ticket, uh, social media blew up and TikTok, especially uh, with all of these different videos about her. And everybody had a very positive um, reaction to her and how she is. So that had caused a lot of buzz and a lot of viral moments. There's also been a lot of things that's been coming out of when she used to be senator. And so there's a lot of speaking moments that she had during congressional hearings. And her team um, dug, up a, dug up a lot of those and used them at the convention. One of the most more famous lines they, she said was, I am speaking. And that was in response to one of the witnesses during a hearing that kept interrupting her when she was trying to make a statement and then try to get the witness to actually answer the question that they have because they were actually avoiding the question. So they're probably hoping for more viral moments so that they could take on and use. Um, they've been using other things that's been going on like what's going on with the debate with President Trump's uh, uncertain and very vague answers before he committed to doing the September 10th debate. And they took um, his rambling about whether he was gonna do it or not without giving an actual answer. And then they added a backtrack of a chicken uh, to it. And I'm pretty sure that that probably stirred uh, President Trump to uh, give an actual answer on Truth Social because not long after that, he posted that. So we'll see how those things will work out. Um, and then what's next after that? Well, let's not talk about the president, presidential candidates right now. Let's move on to the, what else is going on. Well, for those incumbent politicians, even though they're still running, uh, they're often more than uh, most of them are still running for the upcoming election, all of the House representatives, and then a um, section of the uh, state, the senators will actually be running um, as well. They still have a job to do. We, they still are uh, have their job until January 3rd. So for that, they still have many days. What's coming up for them? Well, October 1st. For every federal government employee or military person, they know what October 1st means. It's the first day of the fiscal year. And for anybody that follows politics, it's funding. The National Defense Authorization Act still needs to be passed. <coughs> Excuse me. And then they would actually have to uh, get a lot of those funding things done. National Defense Authorization Act includes of course, the DOD. It also includes a lot of the VA funding. And without that, we can go into another government shutdown. There's been no actual uh, stand down or outlier right yet to see whether um, what they could fight about on a government shutdown it is more likely that they are going to have continuing resolutions until they get a um, a firm idea of what everybody wants for the funding. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything that people are particularly fighting about or for. We still have September <laughs> to try to get all of the funding approved by, August, by October 1st. So we'll see about that. Um, oh, continuing resolutions. For those that don't know, continuing resolutions or CRs mean it's an agreement to basically try to keep the funding going for a short-term um, time frame. Um, very rarely have we actually, I believe it's like one in 50, have we actually passed uh, the funding on time. Majority of the time we have those CRs, the continuing resolutions. Typically they are between 30 to 45 days of, you know, little funding windows. So that way they have, the government can still run and a lot of the different areas can still do their jobs. 
as a former reservist and also somebody that used to work for the government, it's very important to have that, that funding because you really can't do anything. Without that funding, you can't send people to schools. You can't put people on orders. You can't send them to training. Um, you can't even do a drill weekend because there was times when the continuing resolution wasn't even passed and there was a short little time frame. We weren't sure going to uh, that we were going to get the funding for that. And I get a call the day before a drill weekend of, hey, don't come in tomorrow. We don't have the funding to pay you if you come in. That's how it affects people in the reserve and guard. And often people um, of certain ranks and pretty much a lot of reservists and National Guardsmen, they actually depend on that money because that's a nice chunk of change that happen, that comes in for that weekend. And so that can be very difficult for people. It can also um, screw up your scheduling in the, in the future, because if you don't get that scheduled weekend, that means you have to make it up sometime before the, ne the end of the fiscal year, because you have to get 48 points or 48 days to actually uh, have a good year so you can retire like me, uh, that, you know, you got to have an, enough points so that that way you can retire. And so those type of things can just screw up your year and your scheduling. So FYI on how government shutdowns affects people. The other part about government shutdowns that also does affect the government, especially, is that they have to shut down a lot of things. And when they shut down a lot of things, they can't charge for things like national parks. You can't charge entry, uh, entries. You can't do those things and collect that money that they probably need. So actually the government bleeds money instead of actually saves money when they have the government shut down. So if you ever hear a politician say that they're saving money uh, because they're not running or doing anything to do, they are not working, that's a lie. They're actually bought and they're at, or they just don't know what's actually going on because they're actually bleeding money when they don't have anybody working to take the ticket sales, to send people to certain areas. You're actually bleeding more money that way than you are saving money when the government is shut down. Um, so please don't believe those lies. <laughs> so, um, and Oh, with the funding coming on, there might be some sneaker um, amendments that could be coming up. Uh, there were discussions and rumors that they were going to add um, and include women in the military draft. That one doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, it was on the Senate bill for a moment. I don't know if they've taken it off yet. Um, if not, they've. Uh, I haven't really seen to confirm that on the system, but I will keep an eye. I'll keep an eye on that one. There's other things that they could be adding to add a few more rules. Um, there's a few things uh, about the military draft that may come up and may get added because for those that don't know about the military draft, you're required to register with the, um, <laughs> with the select service system. And the thing is, is that you register when you turn 18, if you're a man, you register when you turn 18 and you're supposed Supposed to technically update every time you move, but that doesn't always happen, does that? So there's no really enforcement mechanism. So if the military, if the uh, military actually does have to enact a draft, the Congress has to enact the draft for the military. Um, they are going to have a hard time finding people, and so they're probably going to have to update those systems and try to connect them to the other systems so that they can get the addresses and the contact information for them. It's likely trying, likely they're going to try to connect with the IRS, for example, because they're probably going to be the most likely person to have your most accurate address, right? So you can get your checks or, you know, all of the other good things. So that's going to probably come up with the funding on how they would try to fix that because that has been coming up in the last couple of years. Um, there's other things that might be sneaking in there. And of course, that could be reproductive health because that's been a big thing um, between the fight between the senators and the House representatives. So we might see something come in there. But I highly doubt it because right now, um, reproductive health protections and 
banning abortion has been a very hot topic with the upcoming election. And so those that are for abortion bans have been not talking about it or stepping back from it because so many people are against abortion bans. I believe it's around 60% or more or are against an abortion ban of any type, a total one, but they might be okay with certain weeks. So a total one is not going to work out. But then when you're talking about it in general, that's usually what they're talking about is what that's actually what they're talking about. And then also with all the, all the backlash that's happening from Project 2025 about outlawing all abortions and also outlaw, outlawing, outlawing <laughs> contraceptives, excuse me, I told you speech impediment. And so those type of things will probably be coming up again, and it might start a couple of fights. Uh, watch Senator Tommy Tuberville for that, because he is the one that held up all of the military promotions um, some time ago. And so there might be a long stand that he might have. There might be a few more things that are coming up. So keep an eye out. Um, and it's really good to try to keep an eye on your House representatives and senators because they're actually the ones that are doing the money and the taxes and all of that stuff that most people like to blame the presidents for. They have a little bit more power than a lot of people think. So keep an eye out on them. Fully research your House representatives and your senators because you can actually look up their voting records. Um, actually all the way back to the 80s and 70s. You can look up voting records in congress.gov. Um, the old uh, senators and representatives, you can look up the, the current ones as well. So you can see what they actually voted for because there's a good amount of senators and house representatives that's actually voted against uh, bills that would have benefited the military and veterans. So keep an eye out on that, don't believe what politicians actually say at the podium or when they're trying to campaign. Always back up and look at what they're actually talking about through research and resources. If you don't believe me, look up the speech and debate clause. It's a constitutional uh, protection for our politicians of Congress that they can say anything they wanna say and then not get in any trouble for perjury or lying or anything else. So double check what they say, please. I even double check what the, what the Democrats say. You might think I'm a, I'm a left lane person, but I'm actually pretty moderate and independent. So double check what they say. Uh, Google it. I only trust things like congress.gov. And then if I see something that is not on any type of website that has resources, I always Google and check whether it's legit, whether um, it's true or false. Their snoops.com is pretty good. Other websites also will take that. And I even double check those people too, um, to make sure whether they are left or right leaning. So always check your resources and check and check whoever is running for Congress. Google who's running for my district, who's running for my state. So you can double check the opponents and see what they're all about. Um, there's a lot of people that have a little bit of skeletons in the closet and you're not going to know what it is until you really start researching. Empower yourself with all the information you have and try to make sure that what you are reading is completely true or false. Um, to me, I don't trust articles until unless they actually have resources in them. If you read anything from me, I try to include as many resources as possible, especially if I include facts and also quotes. So remember those things when you're looking out there and trying to make sure what you're reading is true or false.